Okay, so I'm going to talk about esophageal pressure and transpulmonary pressure. Um, here are the disclosures. So I uh, want to try to keep this talk relatively practical. So let's talk about just what the potential applications are for esophageal manometry in our practice. And I'd say there are a lot more than what I've listed here that I may use, but these are kind of the high yield ones, I would say. Um, certainly transpulmonary pressure measurements. So this is for titration of PEEP. Uh, and for look at end inspiratory pressure, Marcelo alluded to some of these issues. Um, they can be used to really differentiate lung and chest wall compliance as the main concept there. So calculations directly of lung versus chest wall compliance or elastance. Um, they're of course the most precise estimate of P musk that we can get, right? So they're very useful as we think about uh, work of breathing calculations, assessing the risk of patient self-inflicted lung injury as an example. They're important as we think about trying to target some amount of patient effort to prevent diaphragm dysfunction. Uh, and they're very useful in our evaluation for weaning and extubation uh, for patients of when they really have achieved that point. They're also helpful right after extubation, especially as we think about this in pediatric patients for us, the patients that are likely to fail extubation. So looking at upper airway obstruction or looking at just use of non-invasive ventilation, for example, after extubation, to identify a higher risk patient population. Um, and then I think, of course, they're really helpful in assessing patient ventilator asynchrony um, and uh, are crucial to have some measure of neural respiratory effort and esophageal manometry is, uh, is one of the, the, the key met methods that you can use there. So let's start first with transpulmonary pressure. And I think, you know, as a review for this, this group, uh, clearly we know that the transpulmonary pressure is what we need to inflate the lung, right? And there is one of two ways that happens. The patient is completely spontaneously breathing. They generate a negative pleural pressure, generates a positive transpulmonary pressure for inflating the lung. Contrast, patients, let's say, paralyzed on a ventilator, we provide the positive pressure for them. Small amount of that positive pressure may get transmitted to the pleural space based upon the elastance of the lung to the elastance of the respiratory system ratio. And again, we get a positive transpulmonary pressure to inflate the lung. And as we think about different concepts, right, we've got a patient that's on conventional mechanical ventilation, spontaneous breathing, or in an assist or spontaneous mode, in all these circumstances, right, the total transpulmonary pressure may be the same, but it's generated in different ways, right? So as a patient's on conventional ventilation, as we look at the alveolar airway pressure, this is a relatively good reflection, for example, of what the transpulmonary pressure may be. But that is certainly not true for the spontaneously breathing patient and as the partial assist modes where they're shared between the two. Um, so as we think about transpulmonary pressure for assessing the risk of ventilator-induced lung injury, we classically think about this at two points, at the end, end expiratory transpulmonary pressure and the end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure. End expiratory transpulmonary pressure is helpful for our PEEP titration and inspiratory transpulmonary pressure to help us think about you know, risk of overdistension and stress really functionally on the lung. And why do we care about this, right? Well, we, as we have seen before, unfortunately, this is a, a problem in the world. Obesity is an increasing, increasingly a problem, right, uh, throughout the world of patients like this that have uh, obesity or intra-abdominal hypertension, ascites, et cetera. Um, and they're at high risk for atelic trauma and alveolar collapse. So we want to try to overcome that increase in pleural pressure that they have, right? So as we think about a normal uh, pressure for a, let's say, non-obese patient, right, then their alveolar pressure at end expiration is zero, slightly negative pleural pressure at end exhalation, so the net transpulmonary pressure, normal under health, right, is slightly positive. If I take an obese patient, right, who has a very elevated pleural pressure at end expiration, now I've got a very negative transpulmonary pressure at end expiration, and those are the ones that are at risk of collapse. So what do we try to do? We try to apply PEEP, right, to overcome this. And if we think about these three different scenarios where here there's a chamber, right, and the chamber pressure increases from 6 to 12 to 20, as the pleural pressure would increase from obesity, let's say, we can keep that alveoli open by similarly titrating the PEEP, right, to that level to keep the alveoli open. And this is, you know, Marcello and Bob's work uh, that highlighted this with the, with the pigs, that conceptually, as you think about a non-obese swine model here, right, and we look at this optimal balance between overdistension and collapse, that translates to a transpulmonary pressure of about plus one with PEEP levels of five to nine. Now, as the obese model was you know, implemented and the bags are placed on the swine's chest, you shift 
you're at a higher PEEP, and that optimal balance point still translates to this end expiratory transpulmonary pressure of you know, one to two centimeters of water. So certainly in obesity, right, where the, the pleural pressure is functionally what's increased, these, these all do align as far as the risk of overdistension, collapse, compliance, and transpulmonary pressure. Um, and this translated, of course, into the humans that they did in their trials, looking at uh, that, that obese, that, that balance for the obese human, again, at optimal PEEP titrated by EIT, also tends to correlate to this transpulmonary pressure of two. And, and Marcelo highlighted this a little bit with um, secondary analysis of the EPIVENT2 trial. But as we look at the first EPIVENT trial, okay, the initial EPIVENT study that was published in 2008, that used this transpulmonary pressure guided strategy for PEEP, where the target was zero, plus two, plus four, plus six of transpulmonary pressure at end of expiration based upon the amount of FiO2 that the patient was on. So if they were very hypoxemic, then it was a higher positive transpulmonary pressure that was the target. And the comparison was the low PEEP FiO2 table uh, from ARDSnet, and there was benefit in this, right? We see that based on the esophageal pressure approach, they had better PF ratio, generally better compliance, higher PEEP values that were used, and this translated into, you know, a very close to significant uh, cl clinical outcome. So that was followed um, by the EPIVENT2 trial, and one of the main differences between the EPIVENT1 and the EPIVENT2 trial was not only how they, they titrated the esophageal pressure, but it was the control group. So the control group in the EPIVENT2 trial was the high PEEP FiO2 table, right? And as you see here, there's a big difference, and Marcelo alluded to this, between the low PEEP FiO2 table and the high PEEP FiO2 table. On the low PEEP FiO2 table, 60% uh, FiO2, PEEP of 10. High PEEP FiO2 table, 60% FiO2, PEEP of 20, right? So, so huge differences potentially in those two, um, those two uh, PEEP FiO2 tables. Now, what we show here is what we do in our pediatric practice, and what you see is, yes, this, this box plots are, are what normal practice is in pediatrics, and this is, now we've recreated this in seven different studies from, you know, hundred, hundreds of ICUs, and it's just unusual, unfortunately, for a lot of pediatric practitioners to turn the PEEP above 10 or 12 centimeters of water, and they fall well below here. And in fact, you know, we have observational data that shows that that is associated with harm, that, that we should at least be using those PEEP levels, you know, that by the low PEEP FiO2 table. And what did we see in the EPIVENT2 trial? There was no difference in terms of outcome uh, for the high P, empiric high PEEP approach with the PEEP FiO2 table compared to, you know, the esophageal pressure guided approach. Um, but what's really important here is you look at this group as far as separation in PEEP levels, there was no difference between the groups. And in the end, the end expiratory transpulmonary pressure was similar between control patients and intervention patients. So it highlights the point that on average, right, the, the high PEEP FiO2 table tends to align on average with the, uh, you know, with the end, end expiratory transpulmonary pressure. But as Marcelo alluded to, there's an important difference in heterogeneity of treatment effect here, that there are some patients that were clearly benefited from a PEEP uh, titration strategy that was based on an expiratory transpulmonary pressure, and there were some patients that were harmed from that kind of approach. And uh, as we look to their secondary analysis, those with the lower Apache scores are the ones that benefited most from this approach. And those with the higher Apache scores are, in fact, the ones that maybe were potentially harmed from this approach. But as Marcelo alluded to, the main point here is that the best outcome for the group of patients were those that were able to achieve this end expiratory transpulmonary pressure that was very close to zero between plus or minus two. And those that were either far above that or those that were either far below that in either intervention or control groups are the ones that, that had the most harm. So, that's why I think there is hope for this, you know, as a potential strategy, because if we get to the individualized physiologic management on a per patient basis, right, esophageal pressure is one of the potential, potential opportunities there, I think, to, to identify that population. Okay, so that's PEEP, right? So let's think about the other side of that, which is inspiratory pressure limitation. And I think we all know uh, Marcelo's work here demonstrating this, the importance of limiting driving pressure and its impact on survival in, in, in ARDS. But one of, the more, one of the important points, I think, is 
remember, it's, if we think about the stress on the lung, right, it's actually the transpulmonary pressure that's relevant or the transpulmonary driving pressure that might be relevant, right? Because the driving pressure as we measure it has lung and chest wall components to it. So if we care about the stress on the lung, then we need to you know, factor in differences that might be coming from the chest wall. And if you've got a very obese patient, the driving pressure doesn't mean the same as a patient that has a very compliant chest wall, right? Um, and so, as we think about limiting inspiratory pressure, there's, I would say, some controversy in the literature about what's the right metric that we should be looking at at end of inspiration with transpulmonary pressure, right? Is, and how do we measure it and how do we calculate it? So one method is the direct method to measure the end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure. This is quite simply taking the, it's the metric that, you know, it's the way we've implemented it within the tool, within the ventilator as an example. You do the airway pressure, you do an inspiratory hold, you take that plateau pressure, you take the esophageal pressure during that inspiratory hold, you subtract the two, that's the, trans, that's the transpulmonary uh, pressure at end inspiration with the direct method. There's the elastance method which would say, instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna calculate the elastance of the lung and the elastance of the respiratory system, and I get a ratio of these two. And then as I look at that plateau pressure, I multiply that elastance ratio by the plateau pressure, and that's what my end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure is, okay? Um, and then, of course, is the transpulmonary driving pressure, which is subtracting off the, the difference that comes from PEEP. And here's an example of how you may get a very different value based upon which method you, you, you use at the, at the end of inspiration. If I take the scenario here, patient with 31 of plateau pressure, PES plat uh, of 16, with the direct measurement, my end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure would be 15 centimeters of water. With the elastance method, where I compute the elastance of the lung to the elastance of the respiratory system, now that end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure is, is 24. There has yet to be a clear trial that demonstrates that the end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure matters, right? And that there's a big difference in terms of outcome between the two. If we look at, you know, at Danny's trial or we look at the Epivent 2 trial, there were no clear differences between end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure um, with the direct method. But then I think there is a question of whether the direct method is really the, the most optimal method to do this or whether the elastance method might be preferred in some of these circumstances. And I think that's my preference for the, for the thought about end inspiratory transpulmonary pressures that the elastance method probably has more meaning, but has yet to be proven, I would say, at, at this point. Um, so one of the problems with these direct measure measurements for PEEP titration or for end inspiratory transpulmonary pressure measurement is you have to have a very well calibrated system. You have to have a balloon that's uh, appropriate for the size of the patient and a balloon that's calibrated appropriately. And if you don't, then the direct measurement can be erroneous and you can have very false results. So some have tried to use alternative systems like liquid-filled catheters or uh, piezoresistive sensors, et cetera. And unfortunately, none of those have gained wide-scale acceptance, and they each have their own problems as well, especially with leveling, for example, of the catheters if we think about a liquid-filled catheter. So the balloons are still what we use primarily, right, uh, because they're the most widely available. Um, but you have to calibrate the balloon appropriately. This is a, a study that we've done, a bench model here with a model esophagus on the bottom, and we have four different size catheters, the six French, seven French, eight French, and five French Cooper catheter. And what you see is that they all have this elastance range, that if I don't have enough air in the balloon, I'm gonna underestimate the pressure. If I have too much air in the balloon, now the elastance of the esophagus comes into play, and I'm gonna, over, and I'm gonna overestimate the pressure that's there. So you have to find the optimal point. If you do calibrate the balloon appropriately, then there's basically no error between, uh, between the measured value um, and what the true value would be you know, in, a, in a model uh, system, for example. Now, there are a couple of methods to do this. Um, the method by Majoli really looks at the difference between the uh, solving for the point of largest difference, basically, between this on the way up and on the way down, the inspiratory value and the expiratory value. Um, and this method certainly works to calibrate. However, their patient must be passive during this method to find that point of, of optimal distance. So the method that we use is much simpler. It uses a, 
the elastance curve uh, of the end expiratory transpulmonary pressure to solve for the point at which there's this inflection in the curve. And this is what it looks like in humans. There's not that sinusoidal shape, but it's more of a slow linear shape. But you can solve for this first inflection point on the curve, and then that's the optimal volume, and generally then that's very accurate to measure the direct, by the direct method of transpulmonary pressure. Now, how can we do this uh, you know, in real life? Certainly, we can do this on the NKV. Here's an example of a patient so that we have. This, this is children. This is children. This, this is oh, very high elastance of the dopamine. Right? Very much so. The slope goes very high, uh, very quickly. So, so we, we take a little bit more conservative approach to find just the beginning point of this curve. Because if you go a little too much, the slope takes off. The second problem is then you really get a lot of cardiac oscillation. Mm -hmm. So then that cardiac oscillation really affects your measurements because it then becomes difficult to, to really find the, you know, the, the, the true measurement because you may have two or three centimeters of water of cardiac noise. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and the pediatric balloons are even more problematic because they're smaller. Um, so here's an example of you know a system that we uh, we have a patient on ECMO right now that's uh, uh, that we're using this esophageal catheter with. We can plug it into the NKV. You have to of course create your own uh, system to inflate the balloon here with the syringe, and then we apply our calibration method to find the optimal inflation volume uh, to put in there, um, and then can do the measurements of the end inspiratory and end expiratory transpulmonary pressures to use it to titrate PEEP as an example. So is transpulmonary pressure helpful? Um, well, I would say for PEEP management, um, there seems to be a signal that titration of PEEP to get to a transpulmonary pressure of zero or plus two might have benefit and especially could be helpful to individualize the PEEP titration, right, for the patient rather than taking a, a very generic empiric high PEEP approach um, uh, at, because of the heterogeneity and treatment effect. But this becomes very dependent upon the calibration of the balloon. So what are the other applications? Well, we can certainly use this to measure patient effort. And the advantage is it is still important to calibrate the balloon, but it's not as, it's not as crucial. Right? If you are slightly off with the amount of inflation on the measurement of work of breathing, you still get reasonably accurate numbers. They're not perfect. They can still have an effect, but you still have reasonably active numbers. So even if you don't get a perfect calibration, you can use it for estimations of patient effort. So as we think about this, there's this conceptual framework that's emerged. The, the plug working group was the, was the group that actually brought this to the forefront of this idea of simultaneously protecting organs, right, during mechanical ventilation, that there's the competing risks of ventilator-induced lung injury, ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction, and patient self-inflicted lung injury. So we want to try to simultaneously balance all those risks as we're managing patients on ventilators. We've talked a lot about ventilator-induced lung injury and how we may be able to use, you know, esophageal pressure on that end. But perhaps where it's even more relevant is thinking about the risks of patient self-inflicted lung injury and ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction. And with patient self-inflicted lung injury, right, the concept here is that the patient can contribute to all of these same processes that we see with ventilator-induced lung injury with high stress or high strain by their own vigorous amount of respiratory effort, especially if they have very large swings in, a, in pleural pressure, as an example. So big swings in pleural pressure can result in a drop in alveolar pressure and lead to adelect trauma. They have high tidal volume from high respiratory drive, risk of lung strain, and they have large swings in high transpulmonary pressure or high transpulmonary driving pressure or large amount of stress on the lung. So this is one of the important concepts that, ideal, that highlights the point that we must identify patients that have very high or large swings in their pleural pressure or very high amount of respiratory effort. The flip side is also true, right? That if the patient doesn't have enough effort, right, then they're at risk of get, developing over-assistance myotrauma. They're the, one, they're the ones that develop ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction. Ewan Golinger has highlighted this well uh, in the ultrasound-based ultrasound studies that atrophy of the diaphragm can occur very frequently in a lot of ventilated patients. And maintaining a physiologic amount of diaphragm contraction or respiratory effort in a physiologic range 
may be one of the factors that we can use to try to prevent those patients from developing diaphragm dysfunction. And what we know in our usual care practice is that most patients probably have too little respiratory effort most of the time that they're on the mechanical ventilator. And as this is paid some pediatric data that highlights the, the e using EDI as a metric, right? We can use esophageal manometry, we can use EDI, we can use diaphragm ultrasound to just characterize how much effort the patient has. That during the acute phase and even at the time before extubation, the amount of effort that most patients have is two to threefold times lower than what it is after they're extubated or even before they go to the wart, right? So we are often really controlling the ventilation and minimizing the amount of effort and this might be contributing to diaphragm dysfunction. And so there's this concept of right targeting the perfect amount of respiratory effort, not too much, not too little. And this has been a point that we've talked about a little bit. What can we use as those ways to target that effort? And I would say certainly the esophageal catheter is the gold standard that we could use to titrate that effort because it's a direct measure of the amount of pleural pressure that the patient has. Whether we target just a simple change in esophageal pressure difference or we use something like the pressure time product from esophageal pressure or the pressure ray product. Those are certainly the most direct measures. Um, and if we think about this, we can then therefore calculate these uh, directly from the esophageal catheter. The two most widely used are the pressure rate product and the pressure time product. The pressure time product requires a measure of flow, right? So they sort of get the phase of inspiration and calculates the area under the esophageal pressure curve. The pressure rate product is what we tend to use in our practice because it's simpler. Um, it's just the delta esophageal pressure times the respiratory rate. Doesn't require a measure of flow to definitively you know, define the beginning and the end of inspiration. And in fact, they're very, very highly correlated in most circumstances. And so for simplicity's sake, that's why we use the pressure rate product. And, and this is what we're testing uh, in a clinical trial to try to find that direct balance point of just enough respiratory effort and not too much respiratory effort, targeting it uh, in, in an optimal range coupled with a lung protective strategy. And this is an ongoing trial that uh, hopefully we'll get some results on in the next couple of years. You yeah, Marcelo. Some, some three studies showing that uh, the, the multiplication, the pressure time is better than looking just the size of the swing. Yeah, so that's a good good question, um, and uh, we've done the pressure rate product, the, the multiplication of the two, for this uh, circumstance of um, the lots of pediatric patients that might breathe with a very, very, very fast respiratory rate and a relatively lower pressure, and that uh, that affects our clinical practice in how we manage them. So you may have a patient that is uh, um, a younger patient, for example, that has a higher physiologic respiratory rate, but we probably don't want the same delta esophageal pressure in that patient as we want in, a, in an older patient. It is a good question, especially for the point that we talked about yesterday, which is that patient that's breathing 10 or 12 times a minute that has a very high swing in esophageal pressure but their pressure rate product is still low, right? Because they're breathing so infrequently. Should that patient also be a, a, a getting more assistance? That won't happen with this protocol, right? But that's an important point about maybe that's what we really should be focused on is just what that swing is and not the frequency of the swing. So from a practical standpoint, the PRP is the easiest to implement but maybe it's not going to be right, and we'll see at the end of the study of whether it should just be the delta esophageal pressure. And we'll, of course, have that data for secondary analysis to know what's the right target. This is, I think, a, a, a good point of question, right? We don't know what's, what's the right target, right? Should we be using esophageal pressure? Should we be using P.1? Should we be using P. occlude? Um, and what's the right value for it? So the approach was let's start somewhere and then see, and then on post hoc analysis, maybe we refine that further. Yeah. Um, I'll just conclude here for a few other areas that where else can we use esophageal manometry? So I think it's also very valuable as we think about evaluating for extubation readiness, um, especially as we want a direct measure of patient effort during spontaneous breathing trials to identify patients that are you know high risk of extubation failure and that might need some 
post-extubation respiratory support, for example. And conceptually, right, why do patients fail extubation? These patients fail extubation when there's an imbalance between their respiratory load and their respiratory capacity, right? And we think about respiratory capacity, they've got either pre-existing neuromuscular disease or they acquired it while they were on the ventilator, for example. What's the, what, what, what's the respiratory load? That's about their resistance and their compliance and their effort that they're generating. And esophageal manometry is one of our key ways that we can measure that effort. And so if we look at the relationship, for example, between this PRP variable and the risk of post-extubation respiratory failure, so look at the measurement right after they get extubated, there's a linear relationship, right? The patients with higher amount of PRP, there's a dose-response relationship in terms of their risk of being reintubated. This is in about 400 children. And if we take a value of 500, which is therefore where our sort of cut point came from for success of a spontaneous breathing trial, then uh, this is a three to four-fold higher rate of being reintubated if they have a, a PRP of above 300 or above 500 uh, after extubation. Now, it is important to also think about this in terms of the capacity of the patient. So patients that have more respiratory muscle weakness, they of course can't tolerate the same effort or the same respiratory load. So here we've got patients with a, a preserved respiratory muscle strength, so a NIF or a PI max value of greater than 30. We see that their rates of reintubation certainly don't go up until they have very high levels of, of, of work or effort, whereas those that have more respiratory muscle weakness, right? Now there's a, a much larger increase in their rates of risks of reintubation, even at modest amounts of respiratory effort. So this is where these combination metrics, like we've talked about before, like the tension time index or the PI over PI max may become quite relevant and quite, quite important because it's combining those two metrics together, the maximum effort that the patient can generate with what's the, lo what's the load on a, day, on a you know, cycle to cycle basis. Um, and, uh, and we have shown previously that these values of tension time index or PI, PI max, or even just the esophageal pressure itself are highly correlated with the risks of reintubation, for example, in children. Um, the last area I'll just mention here, because this is a big problem in pediatrics, um, is upper airway obstruction after extubation. And it's one of the major causes that leads to extubation failure and reintubation. And one of the big problems with assessing post-extubation upper airway obstruction is it's not objective most of the time. It's based upon a clinical exam to say this patient's got strider, and then people will label them as having upper airway obstruction or not. But in fact, it might not all be from the same physiology. It might not all be subglottic edema. Some of it may be superglottic disease. Um, and so you can use esophageal manometry actually to help quantify this uh, in a more consistent basis. And if we think about this from a you know, pulmonary physiology standpoint, the pathognomonic finding of extrathoracic upper airway obstruction is inspiratory flow limitation. No rise in flow despite continued respiratory effort. And we can use esophageal pressure to characterize that. So on this axis is esophageal pressure. This is flow from spirometry, or we can do it with calibrated respiratory inductance plethysmography. And here's an example you know, of no flow limitation after extubation compared to a patient that has moderate to severe flow limitation after extubation. Big drop in esophageal pressure, right, and no increase in flow despite continued respiratory effort. And here's some examples from children, right? This is a patient that was before extubation, as soon as we pulled out the endotracheal tube, this is what this looked like. This is from calibrated respiratory inductance plethysmography to measure flow and esophageal pressure to measure the pressure or the effort that the patient has. You can also use it to differentiate subglottic from superglottic disease. Here's an airway maneuver. You do an airway maneuver and you see the flow limitation goes away. You let go of the airway maneuver and the flow limitation comes back as an example. Sorry, can, 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 can you show? Yeah. Oh, you can't see the pointer. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So here, here is uh, our flow from respiratory induct. You still can't see it? I have to talk this way. Okay. Flow, right? Esophageal pressure here. This is flow from calibrated respiratory inductance plethysmography, bands used for sleep studies, right? So we calibrate it for a measure of flow. And you see here, this is inspiratory flow limitation, the flattening on the inspiratory portion here, no rise in flow despite continued effort. We began an airway 
thrust maneuver. Just a, a simple jaw thrust maneuver. Flow goes up dramatically. You lose flow limitation, right? Esophageal pressure drops. Flow increases if you lost your. You let go, comes back, right? So then you can characterize this patient's got superglottic disease. Yeah. You do that with a patient with subglottic disease from edema, for example, there's no change that we see. And so we use this actually as the way to differentiate superglottic from subglottic disease. And we found that 50% 50 per, 50 of the cases that are labeled as upper airway obstruction after extubation, they're actually superglottic. Even though the, the doctor will say, oh, they had strider, right? No, it's not actually strider. That's right. They need CPAP or they need, you know, they need positioning changes or they need less narcotics or whatever sedation they may still have as residual. Yeah. And, it's, and this is half of the pediatric patients that we see have superglottic as compared to subglottic disease. And so then if you're trying to, you know, say how do we identify who's at risk for uh, post who needs steroids, for example. If these patients get lumped in with the subglottic patients, you'll never really be able to differentiate those two. So that's one of the, and here's an example of a subglottic disease patient with a big response to racemic epinephrine. So here, severe inspiratory flow limitation, they got an inhalation of epinephrine and it goes away, basically, so, yeah. But you can't differentiate until you activate. Yeah, yeah, well, but how you can use it is, you know, now that we have an annotated sort of set, you say these patients definitely were subglottic, these patients were superglottic, you, an, you look at those patients differently for risk factors. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, and then the, the last, I don't, I don't have too much time to talk about, but we alluded to this before, is a measure of a, a, a direct measure of patient effort from esophageal manometry is crucial, really, to, to understand patient ventilator asynchrony. And this is a, you know, an ongoing study that we're doing. We were talking about double cycling and reverse triggering. And in our data set, we see that it's 50-50 in terms of double cycling. Half of them are coming from a process like reverse trigger. The other half are coming from phenomenon related to in, inadequate support, whether that's a, a flow undershoot or a termination problem, right? Um, and the esophageal catheter, of course, tells you the timing, right? You can certainly try to differentiate it by just looking at, you know, was the breath triggered by the patient or not? But the esophageal catheter really gives you uh, definitive data about how different the phase is between the patient and the ventilator. And that becomes important here when we think about patients that have consistent reverse triggering whose neural respiratory rate, right, might be very close to the respiratory rate that we see uh, on the ventilator. And as an example, patient that has consistent reverse triggering here, the set ventilator rate and the patient's neural respiratory rate were basically identical. We dropped the respiratory rate by five, and then there you can, you can eliminate the reverse trigger. Um, and we see that clearly with the, now the esophageal manometry leading the breaths with the patient triggering. So uh, just to conclude, certainly esophageal manometry is an old technique. It's been around a long time, but I think there's still a lot of relevant applications for it, especially for adjustment of PEEP uh, and inspiratory pressure. But this does require a very good calibration of the balloon, which is a real limitation still at this point. Um, can be useful for work of breathing assessments and patient self-inflicted lung injury, prevention of ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction, less important to have a perfect calibration of the balloon in some of these applications, although it's still important. Uh, and then it's really important, I would say, for patient ventilator asynchrony to have some direct measure of neural effort of the patient to understand the, the optimal treatment strategies. That's it. Thank you.